in order to maintain a status of being a hood nigga or being in the streets or whatever it is, you have to glorify the maintenance of the things that come from that environment and who it shapes. And if you don't maintain those things, then you're no longer of your environment. You understand me? Yeah. And so anybody that starts to go against the rituals of what makes a nigga a hood nigga or a street nigga, right? Because, you know, once you come from something, that's always a part of you. Yeah. At the end of the day, Tupac said it best. He said, listen, I got thug life tatted on my chest, but that's high school. You, When you graduate from high school, you keep that experience. You still keep your diploma, but you go on to college. Yeah. You understand me? Don't mean that it's no longer you, but you don't mean I grow. You understand me? I go on to the next level. And being in the streets is it's just like high school. You understand me? It's like, what's after that? Where do you evolve? Where do you graduate from? This conversation about political, economic, and wealth building. Wealth building. This is The War Room. Peace family, 19 Keys, tap back in, man. We back in the war room <clears throat> for some high level conversations. You understand me? Nothing is off limits and we dive in for the culture, man. It's always a safe space for everybody that's here on the show to be themselves. In the last show, part one of this conversation was with my brother, Steve Jones, uh, somebody that I personally grew up as a childhood friend, and now he's getting into this space, you understand me, making a name for himself as an author of his new book that he just wrote, and of course, as my co-host, you understand me, on the War Room Podcast. We about to get directly into it. We'll get into a dialogue, some questions, and y'all already know it's gonna get dangerous, so prepare yourself. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Mr. Keys, Mr. 19 Keys. Yes, sir. Been knowing you for a long time, long time traveling the world with you. Yes, sir. I seen you start from day one, you know, building up your institution and making it to the high level that you are now. And the number one question that I get when I go around the world with you is, was Keys like this when y'all were younger? <laughs> and yeah. I always tell them, we used to call them Farrakhan <laughs> in the neighborhood, but no, he always been a high level thinker. But now I see him transitioning into teaching a lot about cryptocurrency. So can you tell us what is cryptocurrency and how valuable cryptocurrency will be in the near future? Um, cryptocurrency is um, digital money, essentially. When you're talking about the cryptocurrency aspect, now, there's crypto tokens, then there's cryptocurrency, right? Yeah. And it's essentially, I mean, you think of it the same way if you go spend a credit card, you understand me, and you utilize the digital money, it's the same thing to me. The only difference is this particular credit or this particular currency is connected to what's called a blockchain. This um, unbreakable system, you know, that was made trustless to where you can create a system of value and it can't be corrupted, right? So, you know, the beautiful thing is like the dollar is you have something that can't be counter or it can be counterfeited, but there's ways to tell whether it's counterfeited or not. On the blockchain, it's the same thing, right? And the beauty of cryptocurrency, well, being able to create this anonymous money because you can send transactions instantly without actually dealing with a bank. So there's centralized currencies, there's decentralized currencies. Centralized currencies are ones that's connected to an institution such as the bank, or it is specifically ran by the owners or the creators of that token or that currency, right? Now, decentralized is one that's completely ran by the people, right? Which means that you have the developers that create it, but they don't run it, right? It's ran off the blockchain, which is a system of nodes that is created, this new technology, and the system or the currency goes up and down based on the fluctuation of how the people deal with the market. Now, they update this particular technology, um, so on and so forth throughout time to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Or that it gets better over time because there's going to be issues and problems that arise, especially when you got so many people getting into this new adoption, right? And then you have cryptocurrencies that represents different projects and businesses. So some of these currencies have utilities. Right. They may represent something you can do on the blockchain. Right. Um, and then you have cryptocurrencies that represents blockchains themselves. Right. 
So you're talking about things like Solano or Polkadot, you understand me, that's actually on this blockchain system. Now, I educate people on, you know, what's the blockchain, how's it made, yeah. what is made, you know, what's a cryptocurrency, how can you tell if one is valuable, um, when do you know when not to get into a project, things of that nature, and that's when we go into tokenomics, understanding the broader system of why different cryptocurrencies are adopted, right, and how you get them to actually grow. And... For me, it's like looking at a crypto is like looking at a stock. Yeah. You understand me? The only difference is cryptocurrency, for the most part, is going to give you much higher gains than a stock. Right? You could invest in some cryptos and they have a 4,000% return in a year. When you're talking about a stock, you may be talking about 30, 40, 50% within a year. Right? Sometimes only 10%. Right? Sometimes you're on a negative. Same thing can happen in a crypto. It's a volatile market. You know, but when you look at something like Bitcoin and it just reaches all time high, you're talking about something that you could have put money in at any other point in time. You understand me? And you would have made a percentage return on that. Right. Because Bitcoin is now sixty thousand dollars per token at the time of this recording. Right. And most likely it's going to go up by the end of November, probably have a drop in December, then rise back up towards the end later throughout the year. Um, but, you know, cryptocurrency essentially was created. You know, you're talking about cryptography, right? Um, something that is meant to be cryptic, a system that can't be broken into, but essentially can be disguised. And this was something that was created on the blockchain and at first was essentially utilized on the Silk Road, right? But also it was ways that it was created um, in different countries and different places to where you want to have anonymous transactions, yeah. right? To where a person can hold... Um, increments of value without it having to be the dollar. And the dollar, of course, is dying and dead. Them old white man, you understand me, about to get put to their grave, <laughs> you understand me, and never use it again because the dollar is not backed by anything. So the dollar is fiat, that's central currency connected to the bank and the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve, right? But then you got cryptocurrency, meaning that I can create a currency today, right? If I create a currency and everybody start exchanging it, Right? For things of value, then it's in circulation. I just become the U.S. Treasury. I become the Federal Reserve. I become the bank. Why, why should the people be paying attention to cryptocurrency? Why should they be... What is the most important thing that they should know about cryptocurrency right now? The most important thing they should know is about cryptocurrency will close the wealth gap, you understand me, in the world. It is the largest... Um, Wealth transfer in history. It's the most disruptive system in history, right? And not just cryptocurrency, but the whole blockchain itself, right? It's a m m miraculous feat in technology. So when you're talking about crypto and you want to look at what are ways that you can start to close the wealth gap, right? What are ways that when we look at the statistic of black families earn 17000 and compared to white families at 171000 medium household income, how do you close that gap that is consistently widening, right? That we're going to need to decrease the amount of time and increase the amount of money that we make in order for us to be able to catch up. We need to be supercharged with wealth right now. Yeah. Cryptocurrency is that supercharge. You're talking about finding some cryptocurrencies that can take the average Joe, no skills, no nothing. He just sees the opportunity. He jumps into the market. Sometimes people get in there with $100, $1,000, right? Next thing you know, a year later, they're millionaire. Or they got six figures in the bank. You're talking about children that can sit at home full-time and day trade and make money on a consistent basis. Bitcoin went up to 67000 If you understood the technicals on it, right, and how Bitcoin has been acting, you would have known that 67000 was a consolidation point. It was meant to turn around, drop back down to about 60, right? Maybe later on throughout the money's going to jump back up. But what does that mean? So for the average person that can't buy a whole Bitcoin, but let's say if you could, if you was able to buy a whole Bitcoin, you have $60,000 sitting in your account. And instead of letting it go in the bank where you're losing money because of inflation, you put it into Bitcoin. It goes up to 67000 you sell, right, in order to snatch the profit. It comes back down to sixty. you buy it again, right? Either you're going to keep that 7000 you made off of it or you're going to buy more Bitcoin, right? And now you're utilizing the actual currency to buy more currency, right? But, I mean, there's so many different ways. You're talking about sovereignty in the banking system. You know what I'm talking about? 
And when we're talking about a sovereign banking system, you're talking about putting the power in the hands of the people, allowing you to be able to do for self and not have to rely on white institutional, right, institutions to yeah. gain the heart to give to the people to stop being greedy and corrupt. So cryptocurrency is a way for us to be able to gain our sovereignty, a way for us to be able to gain wealth and power. It's an instrument and a tool of financial literacy and wealth building. It's a portfolio diversifier. It's a way where I can create a project and I have access without asking a banker. Yeah. I can collectively pull resources and make money. There's ways you can create hedge funds on there. There's ways you can buy into different stocks and create these collective pools like the block. Anything you could think of will be done on the blockchain. When you speak about cryptocurrency, you do, you do it so fluently. Like, who are the people that inspire you or that you get your information from pertaining to anything dealing with cryptocurrency? Um, you know, when it comes to crypto, I study all different sources. Um, some people I respect in the game know Chicago, Crypto Bully. I just talked to him earlier today. Um, just because I told him earlier, man, you reminded me of what I first saw on the blockchain, which was all of these different things that you can do that otherwise would have been impossible. You understand me? And the beauty of that, you know, it's like he sent me over information on how to create my own hedge fund. Right. So yeah. my students, um, if everybody, let's say if you don't want to. What, what, what is a hedge fund? I'm, I'm about to get into it. So a hedge fund, let's say that you wanted to invest in cryptocurrency, but you don't know how. Right. So you would give it to the hedge fund to manage your money for you in a crypto space. Right. They take a percentage of the cut from the profits. Maybe let's say whatever y'all negotiate could be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent for managing your money for you. Right. So let's say that this hedge fund annually gets a return of 100 percent. So that means that you take five hundred dollars, you give it to them. Right. And then over a year, they will give you a thousand dollars back. But of course, they take 20 percent. So, you know, you gonna get whatever return based on the amount of money that you put in. Now, if you don't know cryptocurrency. Right. And you feel like it's safer putting into the hands of a hedge fund manager. But of course, you know, you can't typically afford a Ray Dalio. You need to have like $3 billion in assets or something in order to be able to afford that. Because good hedge fund managers are going to give you a great return on your money. But oftentimes, they're not taking in small players. You understand yeah. me? So you have to have a certain amount of assets to even be able to broker and deal with a hedge fund. But see, that's the beauty of blockchain, though. An old system that was only for the elite can now be for everybody. Right? So now... You got $1,000 to play with. You put it into the hedge fund. They doing all of the research. They have their strategy on how they're going to get a return on the money. You understand me? So whether it's a long term or they have short term strategies, and then you can decide to take your money out at any time that you want to. And then once you take your money out, they'll basically send you whatever cryptos that you had invested into the project. Now, there's always going to be risk involved. You understand me? Some of these things are in beta stage of the project. Right. But the beauty of it is this is complete disruptive space in financial technology, because that's what cryptocurrency, the blockchain is a financial technology, but it's more than that. Right. So many things can be done. The, the government is trying to utilize blockchain technology right now to put people, you know, uh, uh, Vax IDs on there. Right. Or they can do it to just put your actual IDs on there. Why? Because if it's on the blockchain and it's verified. It's no fraud. You can't counterfeit it on the blockchain. Everybody can seize a transparent transaction of when it was made, when it was put on there. So you can't fake it, right? There's no better ticket than one that was made on the blockchain. That's why you utilize an NFT, right? And earning cryptocurrency is investing into not just your future, but your children's future. Homies hit me all the time. You know, I've had several six-figure days in the market trading crypto. Homie hit me, yo, I just made another 100000 in crypto. Other, I just made two fifty. Yeah. You don't, You wouldn't hear this in the hood. You understand me? You won't hear this on the block. You won't hear this. You know, you're talking about people not saying, oh, I utilize a college degree, right? And I got paid a bonus for my job that I've been working 50 years that just paid me this. Yeah. Hell no, nah, right? But cryptocurrency is the greatest opportunity that not enough people are taking advantage of. Institutional backers are getting into it because they want they can trade out their money system, digital monies and everything. What do you think some of the reasons of, of, 
of why people are not taking advantage of cryptocurrency at the current moment? They just don't understand it. It's simple, right? Let's say average person has spent, uh, let's say Squid Games is 13 episodes. You'll watch 13 hours of Squid Game, but you'll get tired of one hour of education trying to learn something new. But see, the Squid Game don't require you to use your brain. It don't require you to be smart. It don't require you to think. You know you're not going to get no return on your investment besides the social inclusion of being able to talk to other people about it. So it gives it a social value, right? But we are people that are oppositely primed for what? We're primed for poverty, right? Most of our habits and our thinking and the way our mindset is set up is so that we can maintain poverty, not maintain wealth. So if I spend my hours overindulging in entertainment, I'm maintaining my poverty. If I make sure I'm not learning the new sectors, new technology, new wealth tools and instruments, I'm maintaining my poverty. You understand me? If I'm distracted all of the time, I don't believe in knowledge, maintaining my poverty. That mindset keeps me poor. But if you got the opposite mindset, man, this is a new field. I should interact with it. I should learn it. You understand me? But the school system destroyed our ability to learn. So now a lot of people even know how to understand something new. You pick it up for one moment, you start to look, trying to figure out what blockchain, NFTs, and cryptocurrency is. And you're like, man, I don't get it, man. This ain't for me. That's what people say. How is it not for you? Because you didn't understand it at first? So we quit too early, you understand me? We insecure about our learning process and we have a poverty-based mindset. So of course we're not gonna take opportunities. What we do the most is this, we put excuses in front of our opportunities. All right, so we, we're talking about cryptocurrency and what, what is some advice that you can give to people who wanna get into cryptocurrency? Like what are some of the cryptocurrency coins that they should be paying attention to at this moment? Um, advice is, you know, number one, study it if you really go get into it. Anything you want to invest into, you want to get educated on. Never go into anything ignorant and without a plan. Um, so, you know, whether you go get free education from Google University, YouTube University, you understand me, or friend university, somebody that's investing into it, or you can go get paid education, such as, you know, myself, Infinite Wealth Strategies, and some of the other platforms that are out there that provide education at a good cost. Um, but when it comes to some of the top coins that everybody should be paying attention to, of course, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, you know, your safe bet. You want to have that for a long term, right? Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, those make complete sense to always have in your portfolio. You're talking long-term investment. Um, those are things that if you're putting together a portfolio, of course, you know, those, those are safe to me. Um, and then short-term, you're talking about some good gainers something that got a nice market cap and that's going to have a lot of room for growth based on what the industry is. You don't invest based on, you know, um, what the industry is today. You base it on what it's going to be tomorrow, right? So you're talking about things like Polkadot. You're talking about things like, um, well, Polkadot is his own blockchain. Solano is his own blockchain, right? Um, there's a lot, but I, I will really... If, if you're new to investment, I'll just leave you with those two, right? Now, if you want to know what I believe is going to make the next millionaires, billionaires, gaming. You understand me? The gaming industry is going to kill it. If you look at Microsoft, they came out with a two-fold phone specifically geared for gaming. You got to understand, what PlayStation is today, that's what Facebook and Microsoft and Apple want to be. You understand me? PlayStation is like... Even their business model has evolved. Now you can watch movies on your PlayStation, right? Remember they came out with DVDs and Blu-rays and all of that. That same thing is just going to be on your phone. You understand me? The phone is trying to replace everything. And these big tech companies want to merge all things together. And then you have something called the metaverse. And the metaverse is essentially where you can have a virtual meeting space, right? You can do meetups, events hangouts, whatever you want to do in this virtual space. So now it enhances the experience. Like when we played Sims when we was younger, which I didn't truly like that game, but it's a place, it's a whole ecosystem a person can live in. You understand me? Where you have real items that you own that you can bring into the space and build on. And 
for that, you go start looking at, you know, what tokens are connected to the metaverse, what tokens are connected to the build out of the space, what tokens are connected to NFTs, what tokens are connected to DeFi, right? Which ones are going to last long, right? Like you got tokens like XRP, which is one of the most heavily traded tokens, but you know, legally you can't trade it in the US on their brokers because of the issues they having with the SEC. But if that gets resolved, you know, by January, then we can see a nice uptick on XRP. And I believe that that's a good long-term hold, right? Um, and then you got things like Binance. Um, if you want to invest into Decentraland, which is a, a metaverse token, you understand me? You go look at Mana. Um, there's a lot of them out there, but I would start with the long-term ones. I would first start thinking long-term. I'll get my good returns on Bitcoin. I'm going to hold it. I'll let my money sit. You look at the chart over the years, it's a great performer. You get into Ethereum, it got a solid use case. You understand me? Once they do their upgrades, I think Ethereum is going to be great, right? Then you got, you know, your Solanos, um, your Polka Dots. Um, it's another one I feel like I'm missing that I definitely don't want to. Let me open up this wallet real quick because I definitely don't want to miss that. Yeah. Let's get it. Um, I'm not gonna keep that wild in handy, man. Let me pull up my little trust. See what we talking about. Cause you know, some of these coins, man, they got 30,000% gain. You know what 30,000% mean? I mean, you put got them $10 in it. Come on now, at this time of record, I'm looking at this Solana and it's, it's at $203 right now. You understand me? That means that over the year, it went up 10,000%. 10,000% return? 10,000%? There's no job on the planet Earth that's gonna give you 10,000% return yeah. Unless you a billion dollar hedge fund manager. So why you do ain't you, getting no ten thousand. Why do you think it's taking so long for especially the black community to tap into the cryptocurrency space? Oh yeah, Cardano. That's the one I wanted Cardano. to say. Cardano. Yeah, I heard that. Uh you know, a lot of so let's be honest though, a lot of black people are getting into it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Me. Uh, OGs that I know be hitting me up having questions about the blockchain and crypto. I don't be thinking they in the space. You know, but with all things, you know, our community, we react to success. We're not usually the first comers, right? Um, we usually wait till they, you know who they is, they build it out and then we jump in and then we complain about them not making enough space for us. When we have the same opportunities as they. The beautiful thing about internet, blockchain, crypto, even playing field, anybody can get in the game right now. Educate yourself, sit the gut. A little curse a little bit. Sit your ass down uh, and get in the game. Like you and your kids could be sitting in there focusing on building cryptocurrency. You understand me? Like investing again and learning about it. Get into a the, the mo I think the best and safest thing is to get into a crypto community. If you don't have one, find you one. You understand me? Learning by yourself is not the best way. Learning with others is. You understand me? Having that community feel, right? So you know, black people, we from from the hood, you understand me? And, and we don't know financial literacy, so financial literacy has always been our issue. So once we continue to be more interested in things that can give us return, but also not for the game of gambling, but for the game of investing, this generation and the next generations will be completely different than the ones of the past. We're going to have a lot more wealth, a lot more resources. And that's why it's important for us to have a lot more family. So when we get it, we know what to do with it. You know what I'm talking about? That leads me to my next question. A lot of our people, you say we don't jump on things in the beginning because we like results. So when we talk about Instagram and people having platforms to reach the masses, how come they, their pages always get shadow banned? Well, because if they don't, then they're gonna have exponential growth organically. Their ideas, their influence, whoever they are, which may go against the mainstream narrative that wants to control the voice and the mind of the people, right, are going to gravitate towards these voices, these pages, right? So they're going to shut down those things and we need to ban it, shadow ban it to make sure that they don't continue to grow like wildfire, right? Um, and then you have a platform that's for profit. So if I slow down it, then you may buy more ads, you understand me, so that you can be seen by more people, right? 
So you have different algorithmic, then you have uh, changes, then you have the business model, and then you have the powers that be that want to slow down certain advocates, certain voices, people that speak truth and they have platforms that go against whatever their agenda is. I mean, that's, you know, that's my theory of the elite. Let me ask you a question, though. You know, um, you recently wrote a book, you understand me? And this book is about your experiences in life, right? But what inspired you to want to become an author? Whew. I got a deep story, man. My, you know... My name's Steve Jones, by the way, and I wrote, I recently published, self wrote and published a book entitled Six Advancements, How I Overcame Trial and Error. And in this book, I took six traumatic events that I went through in life, and I told the people my mindset that led me to those events happening, and how I had to shift my mindset in order to overcome those traumatic why, why events. Why only six events? Because I picked, I took six of the most traumatic events that I went through in life because a majority of people experience those same situations in life. So I wanted to tell them like what led me to how like how to overcome that shit because it's hard. A lot of people don't have a blueprint. But with me having a voice or, you know, the the, the way I can articulate it, hopefully it could help someone else transition from that space. Okay. What's been the feedback so far on your book from people that's been actually getting it? Um, I have people who call me every day or inbox me or DM me every day and tell me how proud they are of me because once they read the book and they see the way that I live, that I came home and lived in 2021, they can see the difference and they know and they feel it and I've been living bad. I even feel good, but a lot of people tell me that was one of the greatest books they read this year. Now, when you say came back, you mean you was locked up, incarcerated, Man, I was in, in jail, jail, behind bars, doing <laughs> I was a big in jail. sentence? No, nah, I didn't get <laughs> sentenced, man. I, uh, I was actually sitting in jail. I was incarcerated for the last three years for, you know, something I didn't do. How was that? Like, it's corona time, so, you know, I know, you know, we talk, you feel yeah. me, but that's a different experience. You know, we experience corona, uh, 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 um, you know, free, right? Yeah. And there was people like Ellen DeGeneres. She compared it, the lockdown, to being locked up. Yeah. You understand me? <laughs> But I'm sure your experience will paint a different picture than See, being locked in your mansion, not being able to come out, to being locked in jail during yeah. Corona times. So we're doing Corona. When coronavirus happened, I literally, I had, I was sitting in jail for two years at this moment. And I was, it was a Friday or a Monday when coronavirus came out. I think it was on like a Friday when they announced it. And I literally had trial where I can go to court and possibly be, be, be getting released within, you know, during the trial situation. But that Monday hit and they announced that the coronavirus has taken, taken over the world and our courts are shut down. So in jail, we went crazy because we didn't know what the coronavirus was. Like, how can you stop court? There's been people sitting here for years waiting to go and when we finally get here, y'all shoot us down. So then I had to mm. sit in jail another year before because man. we couldn't go to court. So during that year, I was like, man, I came too far to give up. Now I just got to go back in the cell and keep working on myself. Self-help, self-help. I was reading so many self-help books leading up to the coronavirus that I had to put it in practice when it came around. Like, oh, well, maybe it's adversity trying to teach me something. Yeah. But I'm going to take what I learned from these self-help books to manage it. Manage it better, and that's what I did in my mm. time. And, and, and from that, of course, having that experience and being guided from some of the authors that put out these books made you want to have that same impact on people uh, that course. exact same way. Well, I always pride myself on the fact that growing up, you know, in the hoods, in the streets of St. Louis, we had, we got the number one crime rate in the culture. And I can always pride myself on the fact that being around my other friends who was traveling down that road with me, they all came to me for advice. You know, I always been able to articulate it in a certain manner to where they gonna understand it and we go on our mission and we get it done. Like I always been a loyal person. So as I got older, I know that that ain't the right way to be living. If I'm going to try to give advice to anybody, it got to be meaningful advice, purpose, purposeful advice. And plus, I was tired of going to jail or getting shot or 
just being in that How whole environment. Been shot, man? I've been shot three different times. Damn. Yeah. So you ain't never seen Matrix. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, I never saw it coming, man. You know how it happened, man. Being around the wrong type of crowd, it always happened. I used to say, uh, when people ask me why did I get shot, I'd say wrong place at the wrong time. But it's really no such thing as the wrong place at the wrong time because you know what you're into. You were in those, you was attracted to something that led mm. you to be in that environment yeah. at the moment. So let me ask you, man. People always ask me all the time. You know, when you're not in the streets, it's easy to forget about the streets. Yeah. You understand me? You can forget about the conditions, the influence, the reality that persists every single day in America and throughout the world, right? But once you reconnect yourself back to that root and the empathy for what's happening in that environment, it makes you want to help, makes you want to do something. Yeah. So what advice would you give to my street guys right now that you know, we had opportunity to listen to this and that possibly want to make transitions on their life, but they stuck in that repeated cycle. Hmm. I read um, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And if you don't know anything about Malcolm X, he transitioned and walked down his journey. He learned a lot of his information while he was incarcerated. That's 2021, when you say transition, you talking about becoming a Muslim? <laughs> I'm talking not, about becoming a Muslim. Not the day she picked Not, the, the day? not, okay. not none just, of the change in the check. holiday. Man. <laughs> but listen, though, I'm, li I'm reading the book, and he said something that was key and detrimental to everything that I do now. He told, he said that he had to change his information diet. Now, information diet can be everything from media that you watch, the music you listen to, the daily conversations that you have with people. And I just had the, now I, I became more conscious of that and I, I just cut it out. And mm. it was hard at first. Nah, it came deep. with a lot of feedback. Like, man, look, Steve Fagan, he changed. Uh, he's not fucking with us or whatnot. You know how it go, but you was doing it not for them. Not to maintain those relationships, you was doing it for the, the most important relationship, which is the relationship with yourself. Your, the inner you, you had to build up that godly relationship, and that was key to how I moved, man. I was just facing life in prison. Now, <laughs> when you say change, man, that's a reoccurring thing, right? You know, in the hood, people make fun of change. People make fun of evolution. Yeah. You know, they make fun of intelligence, make fun of all the good things, right? Because yeah. In order to maintain a status of being a hood nigga or being in the streets or whatever it is, you have to glorify the maintenance of the things that come from that environment and who it shapes. And if you don't maintain those things, then you're no longer of your environment. You understand me? Yeah. And so anybody that starts to go against the rituals of what makes a nigga a hood nigga or a street nigga, right? Because, you know, once you come from something, that's always a part of you. Yeah. At the end of the day, Tupac said it best. He said, listen, I got thug life tatted on my chest, but that's high school. You, When you graduate from high school, you keep that experience. You still keep your diploma, but you go on to college. Yeah. You understand me? Don't mean that it's no longer you, but you don't mean I grow. You understand me? I go on to the next level. And being in the streets is it's just like high school. You understand <laughs> me? It's like, what's after that? Where do you evolve? Where do you graduate from? Uh, you know I what I'm saying? It. That, that, that's perfect, man. Um, that that got me thinking about like my lifestyle from back then until now. When people see me now, they might see me traveling in the world with you or whatnot. Probably see me post pictures with a lot of celebrities in it. They hit me up and be like, "Man, Steve, man, I'm so proud of you, man. You came home and you did everything you said you was gonna do, man. You living your best life." And I'll be like. I love, I, I understand what you're implying, but the last part when you told me I'm living my best life, I don't like hearing that because every time you evolve, you're going to meet a new version of yourself, which means you're going to keep constantly having to reintroduce yourself to the world. So the best is yet to come with me. I, I only, I've released my book this year, but now I'll focus on what I want to accomplish next. I don't want to spend too much time celebrating just, you know, one, right. one accomplishment. I want to keep growing and evolving and becoming something else because I can never be living my best life. This is just, this is just something, just a, a fleet that just happened right now for me. Yeah, if, if you, real, real quick, real quick, let me uh, fix your mic. It looks like it's dropped down a little bit, a little bit higher. Um, and if you don't mind, I wanted 
to actually ask you a question too, off camera, um, about uh, what you guys said about being in jail and kind of going through that transformation and really reading about that from Malcolm X. Like, now on the Ellen type level, but saying yeah. with respect, do you feel like that in a way was a sense of freedom for you when you were trapped in that situation to like really hone in and focus on the things that were important? It's like what Keith was saying earlier in part one about your mind being like an ocean or like, you know, the wave and it's just consistently going. You can't comment. Like, you yeah. take that advantage of your opportunity to completely comment. Def- that's all you can do. When I sat in jail for all that time, um, I didn't start taking this serious. I have I've been to jail multiple times, but this last time was the most serious that I had to ever deal with any case that I have ever fought or whatnot. And that my first offer was like fifteen years in jail. So when I walked out of court and went back to my cell, my mind just instantly went to the fact that I had to start reading and learning new information and be prepared for the year 2045. Because I felt like if I had to do 15 years, that would be the year I get out. I need to be in tune with what's going on. So it was actually, I quit telling myself I was in jail. I say, now nah, I'm in college, I'm in school right now. So I woke up every day and I only read books that was gonna help me learn something new that I can bring home with me once I was released back into society. Everybody knew, don't pull up on Lil Steve said with no urban novels and all that. Pull up to his room if you wanna got some spiritual books or you got self-help books or something, because that's what he liked. And then once people started knowing that, I was running across all type of books. It was people who would call and want to put money on my books. I say, send me a book. I had keys send me a few books. My sisters would send me books. I would say, I'd rather get food for thought than commissary. Mm. It was just, I kept polarizing my mind to, to the right. I was trying to look for the good that I can use. I, I, I created a vision board. On my vision board, I put that I'm, I want to be an author. I put that I wanted a Rolls Royce coloring in truck. I put... Uh, um, workout um, fitness. I said, I want to get my mind right. So I woke up every day and meditated on these things. And I can honestly say, since I've been home free, everything came into fruition except the Rolls Royce color and trip. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's on its way, though. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you what's one of the things that you went through in the book that you could tell the people about? Um, one of my chapters in my book is entitled Pessimistic Mindset. And I see that a lot, like growing up in life, where in, I, in the hood environment, it's a lot of things that uh, discourage you in life. You might see like people on welfare or your, your family been living on welfare all generations, so you think that's the way of life. So when people come at you with grand ideas, you don't even believe it already because you've never seen no one in your promixity accomplish it. So proximity, but we proximity, don't let that you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that was a, like a way of mixing drinks, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but no, no, seriously though, um, the pessimistic mindset is like key to everything because with your mind control your actions. So once you don't believe in yourself, you, you won't get up and do, do nothing for the day. You'll let the day go back just scrolling down your phone. So I had to learn how to polarize my mind from the negative way of thinking to the positive thinking. I had to be more conscious of my feelings because I knew that the way I feel was determined by the way I was thinking. So if I was feeling bad, obviously I was thinking negative thoughts. So I had to start thinking about, I, I, I created a, um, I, I had a, a notebook and I wrote down 10 things that made me happy, man. It was like seeing my daughter smile, getting a, someone answering the phone from jail or someone putting money on my books that I didn't expect. I wrote that type of stuff down. Or it, it could have been something that happened in the past, a, a, a specific day. I went out of town and this is what we did. I wrote it down. And any time I was sitting in my cell and I feel depressed, I picked up that paper and looked at it. And it made me feel good because I laugh at everything that I see and yeah. I smile about it. And that's how I overcame it all. It, it to the point where it became a habit. Like I was the person in jail that made everybody laugh and brought the good energy once I walked, uh, came out the city because I didn't tolerate no stressing around me. So you was the Dave Chappelle of the I was, I was. I, I, was <laughs> I, I had something that I called um, alligator skin. So if you did anything wrong, 
throughout the day or some 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 crazy, I'm gonna put you on blast at the end of the night. I'm the guy that's gonna yell out the door like, yo, such and such, just let somebody take his food. <laughs> he ain't do nothing. <laughs> You gotta have alligator skin dealing with me because I might, I'm gonna say something that might make you cringe, but that's just how we build character as men, man. Men gonna joke around each other. If you can't handle it, you need to check out. <laughs> so, 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 you know, the book sounds like it gives, because I'm, I'm gonna read it, you understand yeah. me, and then give an update in the book club. It sounds like it actually gives tools that a person can utilize. Definitely. You understand me? Especially going through adverse situations and, and wanting to create some advancements. Because oftentimes what people need is instructions. Yeah. Train me. Teach me how to do it. You know, I grew up in an environment where, you know, the streets, but we also got training, right? Being an FOI, growing up a black Muslim, and my father, my brother, or FOI class, Temple Mosque. You understand I me? Mean, we got training on how to be men, what to do in certain situations. And in the worst time, your training kicks in. Yeah. You understand I me? Mean, when you don't know what to do, your basic training kicks in or your advanced training, depending on where you at. So I'm big right now on consistently training the mind. Like, you know, we dealing with new territory right now in reality. You understand? I mean, we're going through some of the biggest shifts in the history of mankind. You understand I me? Mean, and in the history of this world as far as we know about written history. And so with that being said, you have to have some sort of training when you're in unfamiliar territory, when you're in danger, and when you're in emergency. And this is an emergency time, but at the same time, there's opportunities, but for those who are trained, mentally strong, pandemic hit, pivot, become millionaires, because they training kicked in. They didn't even realize they was training for a pandemic. But when it happened, they trained and kicked in, they created a business, they focused on the solutions, they built something monumental, now they got a story of their experience. Because the years before that, their mind had already been calibrating to do something magnificent, to focus in the right direction, to innovate when they need to. You know, so something like taking your book, for me, I look at that, taking the advice you give as six training methods that a person can utilize for the yeah. advancement in their life especially dealing with adverse conditions and situations. Yes, I, I made it my business to put key tools and to assist in you to transition from that thug life mentality into, you know what I'm saying, becoming a higher self for you. That was my whole goal in creating the book. Like I said, um, like I mentioned earlier, I had been shot three different times. And I always, I used to ask myself, why? Is this steady happening to me? Well, it's because I was doing the same thing. You was in St. Louis each time. I was in St. Louis each time. I was still hanging with the same people. I was still. Well, well you know when they the say wrong building. place, wrong time. St. Louis is always the wrong yes. place. <laughs> like I was still like. Let's be clear too. Every time I've been shot, it was like never no one looking for me. It was coming for someone I was surrounded by or something, you know, yeah. and I'd just be the innocent bystander that get hit each Well, come time. on, you know, growing up in but, St. Louis, that's what it is, though, man. Yeah. St. Louis is a death trap. For sure, for you sure. You understand like, me? It's, like, a, it's a dark city for yeah. me. When I go there and get off the airplane, like, I, I can feel the energy. It's dark for me. I'm always paranoid. My anxiety kick back in. And I know, like, the way I got to operate, I got to be in cars that's tinted up. <laughs> I'm not doing it. certain places I'm not going. And... I, I try to stay away from St. Louis as much as I can, but at the same time, I always make it my business to go back because I be needing to be remind. I need to remind myself of why I left in the first place and why you know what I'm saying why my character the way it is and not. So I be needing to see it sometimes. Yeah, I took that walk, that Sankofa, look back while moving forward, going to Oakland. Last time I was out there, I walked the neighborhood. Yeah. Neighborhood is so different; it changed. It feels safe. <laughs> yeah. It felt like when we was there, and mostly I say that because there ain't no police up and down the street every five minutes. But yeah. it also ain't our wild ass out there terrorizing know, the neighborhood. Man. So yeah, see, we, you know. like I like I said, man, like we was in the streets, but the, they go back to that blueprint that you showed. A lot of people don't have a blueprint on how to transition from the street. Luckily, I had a blueprint around me. It's just that I wasn't paying attention to it at the time. I always had people like you around, like, like I can use us for example. Me and you, we knew each other since we was about 12 or 13 or whatnot. We'll be out on the streets or whatnot, but you left everything alone. 
moved, branded, rebranded yourself, and you've been on a righteous path ever since. But you always stayed in touch with me and kept telling me, Steve, man, get out of St. Louis, come to California. Come to California. And I came up with all the excuses in the world, man, that kept me out there. Had to but, get shot three times. <laughs> had to keep going every time. Time. But I ended up coming out, coming out here with you, and I um, was able to study your work ethic in 2017 when I moved to Oakland with you for a while. And just watching your work ethic, and I ended up going to jail after that, but sending jail made me like, well, you remember how we was living in Oakland, man? We, had, we was in a studio apartment. We was really yeah, straggling yeah, at the yeah, time. like. Surely. You know, financially we weren't we weren't doing too good. Financially but, stressed. Yes, but but when I sat in jail, I was like, man, we didn't have nothing. But every day I watched Mr. Nineteen Keys get up, and he was sitting at the desk putting the work in. I think that was when you wrote the um your book. Yeah. He was putting the work in every single day, like no excuses, man. It was so much trying to distract him, and he was focused. And I had, just by having that mental image in my mind, it helped me make it through jail. And that's when I started writing my book. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, I mean, that goes to environment. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, the images that you have in your environment are the ones that you self-replicate in your actions and your habits and your routines. Yeah. You understand me? Like, imagination is the best friend for a person who ain't got nothing. Yeah. You understand me? Because... Without imagination, you can't believe it's possible. Definitely, you I, that's that's definitely true. I used to, um, like I said, I, once I was reading all the self help books, I'm the guy in jail that's gonna give you the advice that everybody want to pull up and talk, cause they know like they not gonna be stressed once they're around me. And I tell them all the time, like your imagination. I used to knock on my, on the wall and tell them, man, I'm in I'm in Miami tonight on the beach. I'll be imagining that I'm on the beach instead of sitting in jail. So their imagination got me, got, and plus your imagination is what help you create every anything in the world. Nah, imagination is the greatest tool. Yeah. It's, a, it's a manufacturing tool For to sure. produce whatever you want to. Like a lot of people live by their sight instead of their vision. You understand yeah. me? When you live by vision. It doesn't have to be in your sight for you to produce it, for you to see it, for you to know it's possible and true. You know, human beings will give an imagination so that they can, you know, produce beyond their reality. Yeah. You understand me? Like you talking about a, uh, you think about a child, you know, imagining themselves to be a celebrity or to be a star, or to be an athlete or, you know, or to be a millionaire. They don't have it in their environment. They can't yeah. see it there, but they can see it in here. And if they can foster the idea, the image, and the vision, right, then every single conversation they have, thing that they do, play, everything is going towards producing this vision into reality. And then eventually it comes a day where everything that was in their head is in their reality, but you have to be consistent, stubborn, and persistent on your vision in order to manufacture it into existence. So yeah. imagination is key right now because you got all of these tools that's already built by the smart people but the creative people are the ones who learn how to use them the best way. Yeah. You understand me? And we all have that creative uh, spirit or whatnot, because like everybody has desire. Everybody got the desire to be better than the person that they are today. And it's just that you got to, people just got to find a way to tap into that creativeness, though, you know? Because yeah. like I said, it's a lot of people who will distort themselves, whether they self-medicate or whatnot. Or just keep hanging around the same environment to the point where they just get old and never tap into it. And then at that point, they didn't gave up on themselves and everybody else around them gave up on them too. Mm. Yeah. Well, shit, you know, that, that's what always kept me going, man, is just sitting back and imagining whatever I wanted to be. You understand me? And then after that, I worked to produce my reality based on me either educating where I'm ignorant and then taking my work ethic to execute, right? the knowledge that I learned in order to bridge the gap between where I'm at yeah. and what I want to produce. For me, it's just a simple formula. You got where you want to be, then you got the distance between that is your knowledge. Everywhere yeah. you ignorant, it becomes a blockade, right? And then when you execute and your work ethic gets good, then it's going to allow you to become more effective so you go bridge that gap faster. Well, I got the knowledge, now I just need to work. And work yeah. is the cure and it's the a hundred percent secret to all success in the world. Yeah, it works. Right? Whether it's creative work, smart work, but you gotta work. I always say a genius that don't work is useless. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah, and, and speaking of the work, the most important work is working on yourself. Because <laughs> if you're not operating right, mentally and spiritually, there ain't nothing else gonna work for you. So you always work on yourself, and once you, once you, and you know what I'm saying, completely calm in life, and you happy, and you accept yourself, anything you produce in your physical reality is gonna work out for you. Yeah. You had a question, Bri? Oh yeah, let me come in. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. So, Mr. Keys, I know you've been getting into, you know, the rap and dropping freestyles and stuff. <laughs> so, I was wondering, what are your thoughts from the future of the music industry, and do you see yourself, like, potential, potentially participating and, you know, releasing things? And yeah, you know what's funny? Uh, I don't know if it's going to ever get released. But me, Kyrie, and my brother Steve, we actually went to the studio and recorded the song about a week ago. Uh, and then uh, last week when I was in Atlanta, I recorded a song with my brother as well called Shaman. Now, I actually really want that one released, but I want to shoot like a whole video. It got to be an NFT project, and we got to make a million dollars off of it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm quitting after that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, nah, but for real, though. The future of music, man, uh, music will, of course, always be here, but let's say the future of music and technology. I see the future of, you know, the same way people create books uh, and make money off of it. I think that the music industry will get more monetized in more ways. Mm -hmm. You know, for far too long, there's too many broke music artists that's good. Like, mm -hmm. let's look at just art, period. Like, NFTs allow people that were graphic design artists and artists to become, to make six, seven, five, you know what I mean, eight, nine figures, right? Uh, you had people making art for 10 years straight. You understand me? Before this technology comes around, blockchain, NFTs, and now he's selling a piece for $64 million. Mm -hmm. That's 10 years worth of work that literally goes into one project where you get all of these pieces. So, same thing for artists, I believe. Once the blockchain and the right technology catches up, you're going to have all of these artists that's going to have the right platform to really monetize out their talents and their gift. You understand me? And I think the blockchain is going to create that opportunity for these great uh, um, independent artists or unsigned or unhyped artists to really take advantage. We've seen that with Tory Lanez, you understand mm -hmm. me? Um, and a couple other people did NFT projects, but I think the blockchain is going to change the game. And I think everybody that make music continue to make music. Mm -hmm. But if you whack, you, hopefully you got good friends. You know what I mean? And <laughs> they can tell you you whack and you stop making music for it ruins your life. Because yeah. <laughs> everybody mixtape ain't a great tape. You're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, was there any other things you had on the mind? Um, yeah, I know you're really heavy in the NFT world. You know, they call you NFT keys. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I know you teach a lot in your infinite wealth strategies about like how to go about getting NFTs. But I just wanted to ask you what other um, advice you could give to like a beginner coming into the NFT world as far as how to find the best projects that would be good for them or if they should just find like what projects are already doing good like what do you what is your advice on that uh, that's a good question so especially in the nft space i do believe that everybody should sell nfts right now most people don't understand nfts they think mm -hmm. oh i gotta be a big artist i gotta have art people go buy it i don't know why they buying it but they buying it i don't know why people getting rich but they're getting rich mm -hmm. so they confuse the hell is an nft they can break it down non-fungible token but essentially what it is is you know, it's a unique digital asset that's created on the blockchain that allows it to be uncorruptible and you can basically create something of value, right? Um, but all of these projects that's out there, 90% of them, you know, are going to flop in the future, not going to be worth mm -hmm. nothing, right? A lot of people just collecting JPEGs right now, yeah. right? But if you want to really assess whether the project will be good, look at the developers of the project. Who's involved? If I'm being honest, a lot of people just taking advantage of the space right now. Because mm -hmm. there's so many people that's green in the space, they don't look at what they buying as real. They look at it as some magical thing. Oh, I bought an NFT. You still mm -hmm. just bought a picture on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Now, there are some projects. So instead of just buying NFTs, buy projects. Buy because there's real intrinsic value. This artist that put it out there is somebody. 
They are not, they didn't just start today or yesterday, mm -hmm. right? They have a roadmap. They're going to be doing this for a long time. Or is there a significance and culture around this? In 10 years, why would somebody look back and be like, yo, I want to buy that project. I remember when I missed out on it, these people held on to it for some reason, right? But to that point, like you want to be significantly careful. And if you really want to be careful and you want to go for things for the long term, just buy products that have utility. What does it do? So let's say if I buy a V friend from Gary V, the next three years, I can get access to his conference. I can go there every year. And then he adds things in like people actually have airdrops, right? To where just by holding this, I'm gonna get other free NFTs, right? And then people buy that NFT from me and now it's helping me make money and essentially giving me a dividend on a project. But the beauty about NFTs is these people can decide at any point in time, whoever holding their NFT, I can give you even more value. I can say now that whoever's a NFT token holder, you now get discounts at all restaurants in America because I just did some kind of deal with them, right? Mm -hmm. I can say that everybody that gets that now get access to all my educational portals. Like, so look for utility. Think about who's actually involved in a project. Do they have a roadmap? A roadmap is essentially a business plan on how they're going to build out their NFT project, right? Um, everybody might not stick to it, but most people most likely will. But anyway, just have something of value and a reason why you buy it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. FOMO is the worst reason to buy unless you're going in there trying to trade them. If you're trying to get in and get out, oh, I'm going to buy this at ground floor. So you can track some good projects that have a lot of hype. The project got a lot of hype. If you're able to get in day one ground floor prices, meaning that the prices is as low as they go go, it's a good method because you get in there on the new projects and then day two, you turn it around selling it to the secondary buyer, which means they have to buy it at a higher price. So if you want to sell it for short term and you want to be a trader of NFTs, get in projects as early as you possibly can and sell them, right? Some projects you want to hold a little longer because it's basically like with a stock. Swing trading with a stock, you go hold for like three months and then sell at another price. You're not in it for long term. You want some short term good gains, right? Same thing with NFTs. You can swing trade NFTs. You can day trade NFTs. Look at it like a stock market. But if you go look at it like a stock market and you really go invest in something, why is this project valuable? Look at the NFT space as projects. I use NFTs in all kinds of different ways. The woman that bought my first NFT for $16,448, I love saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably worth like $20,000 based on the ETH she gave me now. She got a book coming out. It's about Airbnb. She does Airbnb. And so guess what? I'm going to help her market that book. Mm -hmm. And whoever owns the next one, I might decide to help them. I might pull up on them and have dinner. If somebody go buy it from her, mm -hmm. then they can sell it. But at the end of the day, when she first bought it, the one utility was you get a one-on-one -on -one consultation, meet and greet, and then I can decide whatever other value I want to get. But of course, you had the value of buying my first NFT I ever put out there on the blockchain. Now, if I become more famous than Michael Jackson, you understand me, then, which will probably going to happen in the next 19 years, then that NFT going to be worth all kind of paper, mm -hmm. right? But I do caution people. Most of the NFTs you buying are not worth anything. Most people are getting into a space that they don't understand and they buying it just because they don't understand it, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that, oh, it feels like I'm buying magical NFTs. You're just buying pictures. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, if you buy a project, you buy utility, you buy into real art that you love, you will not have no regrets. So if you want to go with the strategy of just buy what you love, I go in there sometime and just see really dope art by really dope people. And I want that. I want to own that. Because if I put up some NFT screens in my crib, guess what? I now have them around my place the same way I have still photos, mm -hmm. which I own, right? So I think that, you know, that's the beauty of it, um, you know, um, getting into these NFTs early and then just also understanding the digital space. Like, you can transfer what you own as an NFT onto another platform. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you're into virtual reality or something, you can take some of these NFTs and actually transfer it into virtual spaces. You know, so you really want to study and understand this industry. But at the same time, if you sell clothes, right? Let's say you do modeling, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say if somebody wanted to book your service, right? Um, and let's say it's not even booking. Let's just say a photographer want to shoot with you. You put up 10 NFTs of yourself. Now, whoever get these, it could be a low price, right? Let's just say that, you know, it, it's not even about selling them. 
as much, but it's more so about just booking your time, mm -hmm. right? So let's say you shoot with a photographer and you're doing it just to get some looks. It's not like, like one of your paid bookings, mm -hmm. but both of y'all get compensated because you get the pictures and they get their portfolio built as well. Mm -hmm. So let's say they go in there and you got pictures of yourself and one of them is a picture of you outside and you basically saying that, or you just got a picture of outside and you saying that if anybody wants to shoot outside, they have to buy this NFT, right? The NFT could be $20, $50, but what it's saying is you're booking the opportunity. Now you can reject or you can respect the NFT. You can say, nah, I don't like this photographer, they're a creep, they're a weirdo, or they ain't got good shooting quality. Or you can say, well, if I actually like this person, then yes, I'm going to shoot with that background, right? Like, you can come up with all kind of different things that you want, or you can just sell, you know, photos of yourself on there. Or if you got a business model like myself, the person buy my NFT, they get access and membership into Infinite Wealth Strategies. Mm -hmm. right? So you're saying that people could post with photos, like, professional photos as nfts it's not just about art nah you can make anything an nft i can take a picture of you right now you understand me and post it it's an nft mm. but what makes it valuable see nfts have what they call unlockables the, yeah the value around the NFT. yeah so the unlockable if you buy it what does it unlock though that's the beauty of it okay. right so you know there was one woman i think she sold her soul as an nft Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was her heart. So hard. You understand me? Basically, she was selling her love. Now, I can't tell you whether she in love with the person, but he bought it for, I think, I forgot him. Mean, he spent a lot of thousands on her love. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So she might be in love with him for real. Mm -hmm. You understand me? But, like, it's just this idea that she really sold, mm -hmm. right? It's not her real love, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, at the end of the day, if I take a picture of my crown and I say, well, whoever buys that picture, uh, every owner of this NFT will actually get a real crown sent to them. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So now it incentivizes me to buy it. But what I'm also doing is it incentivizing you to sell it. And so what I'm doing is saying that if you can show me a transaction record in the next 30 days that you own this NFT, everybody who owned it will be sent one. So what I just did is I decreased my returns because I can't get returns on the blockchain and I can't get chargebacks, right? So now I'm earning cryptocurrency because I'm selling products on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. You understand me? So, or I'm selling services on the blockchain. You can sell houses, fractions of land, anything. It's like they can become concert tickets. You understand me? Like the blockchain can be used for so many different things. It can authenticate art, right? Mm -hmm. They have ways where you can embed um, um, technology into the art you understand me? That's connected to an NFT and I can tell if it's the real one or not. Mm -hmm. And there's no way you can counterfeit that. Right? So like, it's a technology and I think it's just the best use case of blockchain technology that we've seen thus far. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's a way where you can make millions of dollars, thousands of dollars, or you can just get on there to buy cool digital art because that's the world we're living in. Okay. And then vice versa, putting up art. How would you say, because I feel like a lot of people that are making a lot of money on this art is they already have a name for themselves. They have a big brand. So that's why it's kind of backed by their, you know, followers and stuff mm -hmm. and following. So for somebody just starting off getting into the NFT space as like a, maybe they're, they already have like a um, portfolio of mm -hmm. art, but they're not as well known. Yeah. So how would you say would it's that they would do like make a pro that sorry yeah how yeah. would they market it and make it to make profit okay. from their art on the in, in, in the NFT space? Well, you know I've seen a lot of people. So number one, here's the number one thing you got to do is you got to put it on a blockchain, mm -hmm. right? Most people that have that question have never minted an NFT, mm -hmm. right? That's go dramatically increases your chances of it being sold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, I say that because random artists don't know who they are. I bought pieces for $1,000. I bought pieces for $3,000. Mm -hmm. I don't know who they are, but I just love the piece. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is there's people that are just going on there looking for art all day long, looking for projects, and they're just buying, mm -hmm. right? So to dramatically increase your chances of selling an NFT, you must first make and mint an NFT. Mm -hmm. You understand me? But secondary build a community or become a part of an engaged community, right? Mm -hmm. um, you want to try to build hype around it. You understand me? Get Listen, you can't sell what people don't know. 
Mm-hmm. You understand me? And you'll be surprised what people might like. Right? So marketing. You understand me? But I would look at it like it's like any business. There's no magic to it. You can't sell products that people don't know about. You can't sell products that are not marketed and branding. Mm-hmm. Branded. People that's there's there's people that's making millions of dollars of art. I don't know most artists' names. I don't think I like I don't know no artist names for real. Mm-hmm. You understand me? But they sell art every single day, right? Mm-hmm. They're not celebrities. They might not even have a large following. They might not even use social media. But because they sell art and they're at places where people buy art, they are selling more art. Mm-hmm. You understand me? Most artists are not in the places where... Most artists that don't sell art are simply not in places where people buy art. Mm-hmm. You understand me? Yeah. And the NFT space is the biggest, it's the largest marketplace of buyers of art that has ever been created in the world. Mm -hmm. So if there was ever a time for an artist to sell their art, it would be right there on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate your questions. Thank you very much. Listen, family, if you want to know more about NFTs, uh, cryptocurrency, the blockchain, metaverse, different technologies, you want to be a part of a community, you want to get triggers, on different in uh, crypto you should be buying or nft projects um and you want to increase your knowledge before 2022 make sure you join infinite wealth strategies if you watch this broadcast utilize discount code hmm what we want to make the discount code what's going to be the name war room there you go discount code war room you understand me and get 44 percent off of your infinite wealth strategy course and that'll give you access till 2022. So I look forward to seeing y'all tap in. We'll go everything from hedge funds, how to create your own tokens, how to actually three book, uh, uh, write a book, you understand me, in less than three to four weeks and put it on the blockchain, how to market it and start selling it, how to market and start selling your art. We got plenty of strategies. My students have been making thousands and thousands of dollars since they joined. Their portfolio is looking good, you know what I'm talking about? So. There's really no reason for you, your family, your babies, your sister, your auntie, your baby daddy, your baby mama, your next baby daddy, and everybody else to tap in. You know what I'm talking about? And make sure y'all go get my brother book, Six Advancements of How I Overcame Trial and Errors. I ain't gonna lie, I forgot the last part. I was gonna, I was gonna try that. <laughs> Six Advancements How I Overcame Trial and Error. Make sure y'all follow also my good brother Steve Jones and the beautiful Rihanna Coulter. Thank you very much. AKA Brie Coulter. AKA Brie Coulter, AKA Brie Coulter. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's the war room, man. We, we still at war with everything that's outside. So we're gonna help you tap in, get your resources. It's a safe space to be who you are, to tap in and do for self at the end of the day. You understand me? I'm 19 Keys, I'm the general. Peace. This conversation about political, economic, and wealth building. Wealth building. This is the war room.